Hello, everybody. Let me tell you a little story, a little, how shall I say this, preface to this um, bio I'm about to do or try to do. I really had an intent to tackle uh, Quincy Jones. And whenever I'm uh, doing my prep for these things, I always play the music of the artist that I'm going to cover. So I put on uh, random Quincy Jones, and the first thing I heard was this wonderful flute sound. And it had been 20 years or more since I'd heard that sound. And I knew exactly who that was because no one sounds like the person I'm getting ready to color right now. That flute player was Hubert Laws. Oh yeah. Born November 10th, 1939 in Houston, Texas. To Hubert Sr. and Miola. He was the second of eight children. And in that family were a lot of musicians, including his younger brother, Ronnie, who was the very first saxophone player uh, with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And Ronnie Laws was also one of the people who launched the smooth jazz craze. Bip! Everybody knows that. That was just Ronnie Laws, man. Oh my God, what a groove. Big sound. Yeah, anyway. He also had sisters that sang, man. Deborah and Eloise and a couple others. And maybe a distant cousin named Pam who used to hang out in Tallahassee and play with a lot of great musicians there, including my young son, Greg. So, uh, but Hubert lost that sound. And I had discovered Hubert actually when I was in high school because they have this joke. If a snake and a trombone player are crossing the highway and uh, they both get run over by a truck, which one missed the gig? The answer is, the snake missed the gig because trombone players never get gigs. <laughs> that was my lot as a kid. And trying to find examples of great trombone players was pretty difficult as well, J.J. J. Johnson and a few other. But there was this guy, Wayne Henderson, who played with a group called the Jazz Crusaders, not Crusaders. And on their early bios and early album, there was a mention of a third horn player named Hubert Laws on flute. I always remember that. He didn't last long. The Crusaders had been the Jazz Crusaders, and before that, Night Shift, which was more of a R&B version, and then the Modern Jazz, uh, Septet before that, and before that they were called just the Swingsters, so they went through a whole lot of permeations before becoming the Crusaders. And Hubert was there in the very beginning playing with them at the tender age of 15. He split from them in 1960, I think, uh, just before 1960. Uh, they wanted to go and start their careers out west and he wanted to continue his education because Hubert had as much of a love for classical music as he did for jazz and R&B. So his first stop was the great HBCU, Texas Southern University. And that is where he got his start uh, with formal uh, flute instruction. But always, uh, always classical as well as jazz and R&B. After TSU, he went out to California, maybe to hook with his boys again, maybe become a member of the Crusaders again. Didn't last long, because somewhere around 1960, he got an offer he could not refuse. And it wasn't from Don Corleone either. <laughs> 
It was from the Juilliard School of Music. They say, if you come, we'll pay everything. The full scholarship to Juilliard, what? Off he goes to Juilliard. How can you not go? Because the flute instructor was none other than Julius Baker. Now, just a little bit about Julius Baker. He played with the Pittsburgh, the Cleveland, the Chicago, the Metropolitan Or Orchestra, the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia. He taught at every major university and he was considered the master of classical flute. And this is what Hubert Laws wanted. He wanted that refined technique, clear, fluent, perfection. He wanted a fat, dark flute sound, seamless from bottom to top. That's what he wanted. So he started with Julius Baker. Girl. Julius was the man. And Hubert wanted to be the man too. Now, you know, you gotta make a living when you're in New York. New York is expensive. So while he's at Julia doing his classical thing, studying for Ray and Bach and Stravinsky and all that, he's spending nights in Spanish Harlem with Mongo Santa Maria. <laughs> And playing the Afro-Cuban thing and the soul thing and the jazz thing and whatever thing he can play to make some money to make a meal to continue his education. Yes, he did. He started playing with little groups here and there, doing solo appearances and this and that and hooking up with this guy and that guy, but he's still doing classical and jazz. Um, he uh, ended up hooking up with CTI, which was going to become one of the big labels that actually launched the precursor to smooth jazz in, say, the 70s. I call it instrumental R&B. He convinced them to let him blend classical and jazz. And so he's recording uh, Stravinsky and Bach and Brahms and Laure and WC and all that, but with a jazz accompaniment with people like Ron Carter and Bob James and the great Latin percussionist Ayeto Moyera. Now, he didn't get very far with the jazz people with that. But he won lifelong affection from classical aficionados who heard their music put in a more modern context. And so here we go. Both roads full steam ahead. He started working as a leader with his own band somewhere around 1964. This would have been four years after uh, being in New York at Juilliard. And while he's still working with everybody, and when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Uh, everybody wanted him. I remember Stevie Wonder was so happy to have him on one of his records, he called his name out loud. He wanted to be like, this is a studio thing here, he's got this flute player. He said, now nah, Mr. Hubert Laws. He was, yeah, boisterous about it. Not just Stevie. Hmm. Call it Simon? Huh? Is that stretching out a little bit? Aretha Franklin? Huh? That's stretching out a little bit? Yeah. You name a jazz musician from Clark Terry on? He was there. Yes, he was. Rock musicians, he's there. Even with the Bee Gees, he's there. In other words, anybody who heard 
Hubert Laws wanted that sound on their recording. There are hundreds of recordings with great flute solos that have one thing in common. Hubert Laws. Somewhere around, he survived through the 70s and got up to the 80s and things were not working with CTI. And if you look on his list of recordings, you won't find anything past 1980. But he did three albums between 1980 and 1983 that he produced himself. By the way, his first album back in the uh, 60s was called The Laws of Jazz. <laughs> he had a sense of humor. He even did one with his little brother, Ronnie, the Laws brothers family. But 83 broke his heart. And so for seven years, he went back to Houston and just practiced and took phone calls. Yes, yeah, Stephen, when do you want me? Okay. Yeah, Carly, when do you want me? Thank you. Yeah, Aretha, when do you want me? Thank you. And then he got a chance to record more classical music in 1992, 93 with two divas from the opera stage, but not what you would expect. An album called Spirituals in Concert with Kathleen Battle and Jesse Norman, the two top operatic voices of African-American persuasion in the last 50 years. And who did they call to join them on stage live? Of course, someone with extreme refinement and flawless technique. It's a Hewitt Laws. Quincy Jones would not make a recording with any flute player but him, period. But I can't have Hewitt. I ain't gonna have no flu. And that's that. That spiritual album put him back on the scene. But once again, he is doing classical and he is doing jazz. Now he never became a household word for the general population. The people, so to speak, never really embraced him. I think that broke his heart. He was just a little bit too refined, I guess. I don't know. He wasn't like Hervey Mann about the groove and the dance. He was just maybe a little bit too eccentric, a little bit too technical, a little bit too esoteric, not really sure. I love him. But the critics and the experts, they know him. National Endowment for the Arts honored him 2010. He was declared a NEA Jazz Master in 2011. Downbeat Magazine declared him the best jazz flute player on the planet 10 years in a row. And surprisingly, seven years, he actually won a critics poll as the best. Sometimes it's like a difference between McDonald's 
and Burns Steakhouse. <laughs> One is a whole lot more popular, but the other is a much, much higher quality. And that's Mr. Hubert Laws. Funny thing, we were talking about the future of the flute. <laughs> Uh, Dave Valentine learned to play the flute by copying Herbie Mann licks in order to win a girlfriend. And of course, Dave Valentine had been a percussionist and uh, well, all into the rhythm of kunga and dambali, so he and Herbie had this thing with rhythm. But when Dave Valentine wanted to sit down and really learn to play the flute, he sought out Mr. Hubert Laws for private flute lessons. And Hubert Laws became his mentor for his entire career and life. Just something he did in the background. So those of us who are musicians and those of us who have that critical ear, Hubert Laws stands alone, a giant. Trust me, put on any human laws. And after hearing the first note, you will know that this is something highly unusual and very, very special. And then go back to all those Quincy Jones albums you love so much of that great flute sound. And guess what? That's him too. And then ask yourself why over a hundred artists have had their recordings graced by the wonderful sound of Mr. Hubert Laws. Hubert Laws still lives in Houston, Texas. He's A3 years old, and I'll bet you, if you find out where he lives and you drive close enough, you can hear that wonderful sound he makes every single day. Now, we all talk about Winter Marcellus and how he won a Grammy and jazz award in the same year. But the very first African-American to chart that path was Hubert Laws. And Hubert Laws went further than went and did on the classical side because Hubert was actually a member of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and when his teacher, Julius Baker, was not available for a concert with the New York Philharmonic, it was Hubert Laws who would take off his three-piece suit and leave the Village Vanguard and go over to Symphony Hall with his tuxedo and play with the New York Philharmonic. Ladies and gentlemen, do yourselves a favor. Check out one of the true wonders of the world, the sound of Mr. Hubert Laws. Thank you very much. <laughs>